as interesting, as exciting money is, I think banking as a business is Mahaboring. I mean, what is this business? So on one hand, a bank borrows money at an interest rate and then it lends that same money at a higher interest rate and it pockets the difference. Now for something so uncomplicated, analyzing a bank scares even the most ardent investors. But come to think of it, a bank's operation is no different from a manufacturing company. It starts with the raw material, which is the money, the deposits that you and I supply. A bank needs to create good products, which includes loans, payment gateway, cash management services, lockers, forex, mutual funds, etc. Like any business, it has to give good service so that consumers remain loyal and avail more services from the bank. And of course, a bank needs to avoid fraud and manage portfolio losses via a strong risk management framework. So the simple four-step framework is how we'll be looking at the banking industry in India. And by the time we are done, you should be clear on what are those specific points that one needs to look out for when analyzing one bank or a bunch of banks. This video is my fifth industry analysis to go with life insurance, REIT, cement, and the hotel industry in India. If you haven't done it yet, then do subscribe to my channel. And if you find this useful, then do give it the thumbs up as it would help me with the YouTube algorithm. Let's begin. We begin with the raw material and understandably, everything starts with the money that we deposit in a bank. This money goes into a savings account or a current account or a term deposit. And the bank is expected to pay us an interest on this, which is why this money is tagged as liabilities in the bank's accounting records. Now, Indian banks have seen a tremendous growth in deposits over the last two decades. And what was just 8.5 lakh crores in the year 2000 has multiplied by almost 20 times in these last 22 years. Amongst the banks, the big daddy is of course the State Bank of India. But what's interesting is how HDFC Bank has not only come a lot closer to SBI, but has also left behind many of its private peers like ICICI and Axis Bank. So when analyzing banks, deposit growth is a key number and as an investor, you will want to give preference to those banks whose deposits are growing faster than the industry average. But this deposit number cannot be looked in isolation. In fact, an understanding of where this money is coming from has a large bearing on the profitability and therefore our evaluation of the bank. And for this, we have to study what is called the CASA ratio. CASA stands for current account and savings account and the CASA ratio is the money in these accounts as a percentage of the total deposit. For example, HDFC Bank in March of 2022 had a total deposit base of 15.5 lakh crore. Now of this number, about 7.5 lakh crores were in current and savings account, which puts HDFC Bank's CASA ratio at 48.2%. Other prominent banks are also within the same 42 to 48% range, with the notable exception of Kotak Mahindra Bank, which is at a CASA of 60%. But a number like 60% need not imply that Kotak's book is better. To prove a point, and I'm sure you would have observed, that banks like Equitas, Bandhan, and ITFC First have been enticing depositors with high interest rates on their savings account. It's a strategy that might be helping them build their deposit book faster and visibly their CASA is also high, but there are still two problems with this. Firstly, the CASA is high because their interest rates are high and this money can easily vanish when they normalize the interest rate or if an aggressive competitor comes along. Secondly, this customer base is not made of many small depositors, but it is built around a few wealthy customers. In CASA terms, this is called granularity. And the more granular, the more subdivided the customer base is, the better it is. For instance, HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank is where a lot of the salary accounts are. I mean, Exhibit A is actually me and I have changed six jobs in India and wherever I went, it was either HDFC or an ICICI Bank salary account. In fact, the most granular CASA in the country is with the State Bank of India, which holds the salary account of most government employees. In that context, I would say a 48% CASA at HDFC or ICICI and even a 45% at HBI might be better or at least on par with a 60% CASA ratio at Kotak Bank. But the question is, why am I talking so much about CASA? Well, a high CASA ratio is another way of saying that the bank has access to funds at a very low cost. You see, banks usually don't pay any interest on current accounts and the interest that's paid on our savings account is pitifully low. Which means for an established bank, its cost of fund should be in the 3 to 4% range with some allowances made for the interest rate regime in our country. So to sum this up, the higher and the more granular the CASA ratio is, the lower is the cost of funds, which in turn can boost up the profitability of that bank. 
The other side of deposits are the advances or loans given by a bank to individuals and corporates. Over the last two decades, banks have seen the loan book grow by 16% per annum and this number is now at 118 lakh crores. The big driver of credit growth in these last two decades has been retail loans, personal loans, vehicle loans, home loans. And as aspirations go higher and since India has a large consuming population, there is every likelihood that we'll see a 14 to 17 percent credit growth for at least the next two decades. Now, of the 38 lakh crore retail book, about half of it is in home loans. There is a decent chunk in personal loans, which is then followed by vehicle loans and credit cards. In fact, to give a perspective of how things have changed, in the year 2000, home loan outstandings were 2% of India's GDP and today it is 10-11% of our country's GDP. Understandably, home loans are the safest of loans and even if a bank has a 4% cost of funds, it is more than happy to lend to a home loan customer for 20 years at 8-8.5%. Now, after home loans comes in gold loans, which are lent at 10 to 11 percent, then car loans, which go at 11 to 13 percent, depending on the car and which bank, etc. Then unsecured personal loans, where the interest rate varies from 11 to 16 percent. And of course, credit cards, where this number goes up to 40 percent. The type of loans a bank focuses on has a big bearing on the yield and the risk of its assets portfolio. And this is something we'll be talking throughout this video. Now, when we look at the loan book for each of the banks, we see private banks having a much larger focus towards retail. But what I want you to understand is why Axis Bank had a mere 20,000 crores of retail loans in 2010, which is obviously a lot higher now. You see, until 2010, Axis was not really a retail player. But once that bank realized that retail lending has much less delinquency, it has a low loss rate, and that it provides a lot more stability to the balance sheet, Axis also hopped on the retail bandwagon and have grown their retail loan book by 15 times in the last 10 years. In fact, the issue with corporate loans is that it is quite lumpy, that is, a single entity can be holding anywhere from 100 to 10,000 crores, and if one such loan goes bad, then it can make a big dent in the bank's profitability. Additionally, the bigger the loan, the lower are the margins, and that's because the borrower is definitely going to shop around and negotiate for a better interest rate. On the other hand, retail customers that are spread across lakhs of people don't have the ability to negotiate prime rates from banks, they don't fall into repayment problems at the same time, and overall, the default rate is lower than corporates. Now, banks like the State Bank of India and other PSU banks do a lot of corporate lending because A, there often comes a government mandate and these banks have to follow it. And secondly, corporate lending does not require as much effort as retail, where one needs to set up collection centers, build technology, invest in call centers, etc. Okay, so we've discussed deposits and we've discussed loans and what banks get out of this borrowing and lending activity is the net interest income. In simple words, the net interest income is the difference between the interest income a bank earns from its lending activities and the interest it pays out to the depositors. A derivative of NII and a more commonly used term is the net interest margin, which provides a better visibility into the profitability of a bank. For example, SBI's net interest income for FY22 was 1,20,000 crores, while HDFC Bank's NII was about three-fifths of that. But from a NIM perspective, SBI was at 3.1%, while HDFC Bank scored at 3.9%, which partly explains how these two variables can change from bank to bank depending on the type of deposits they have, which is retail versus corporates, the interest paid, as in SBI versus Equitas or Bandhan Bank, the CASA ratio, the types of loans offered, as in corporate, retail, home loan or credit cards, the asset quality, etc. Point blank, the NIM is an important number and the higher this number is, the better it is. Now, some banks will have a NIM of over 4% while most others are between 3 and 4. Anything less than 3% should be considered as a soft red flag and should be generally avoided by customers. So essentially, banks that do more of retail have a higher NIM, but that doesn't mean a bank should avoid corporate and do only retail. And in fact, most banks strive to find a balance between the two. But as far as investors are concerned, one needs to carefully track the NIM on a quarter on quarter basis. And if there is any fall in that number, then make it a point to attend the next earnings call of the bank to understand what happened and what is the management really doing about it. 
All right, we now look at the risk variables of a banking business, which is the single most factor that will make or break a bank. The first variable to look at is the bank's capital adequacy ratio, which is a measure of its financial strength. The CAR formula takes into account the bank's capital and risk weighted assets. And although this formula looks scary, all it is trying to tell us is if the bank has enough cushion to absorb a reasonable amount of losses before it becomes insolvent and consequently loses its depositors' money. Now, per the RBI, scheduled commercial banks in India are required to maintain a CAR of 9%, while Indian public sector banks have to maintain it at 12%. Presently, most Indian banks, including PSUs, are right now sufficiently capitalized but this was not always the case and Indian banks have seen some really sticky periods in the past. As an investor, it is very important to track this number and if it comes somewhere close to 12%, even 13%, then it's probably good to bail out and preserve one's capital. And yes, as a general rule, higher the car, the better it is. The other risk parameter is the NPA bit, which is also a function of the kind of loans a bank has given. So NPA stands for non-performing assets and represents those loans whose interest and principal amount have been in overdue state for a fairly long time. In other words, these loans are in the danger of not being paid and a loan turns into an NPA if interest or installments are not received for a period of three months. Understandably, a high gross NPA ratio is bad as it means the bank's asset quality is in a very poor shape. In fact, the entire banking industry in India was in a very precarious position just four, five years back when the gross NPA ratio was at a worrisome 11.5% and it took a lot of cleaning up and policy changes to bring it down to a more manageable 5%. When we look at it on a per bank basis, we see a lot of variation on this front. One of the banks which has managed this very well is HDFC with its gross NP hovering between 1 and 1.5%. 1 and you can see the other end of it with Punjab National Bank which is flirting with some real danger. So these are important numbers to track because if a bank messes up its lending, like what happened with PNB in the 2016 to 2018 period, then not only does it bring down the profits of that bank, but cleaning up the balance sheet is a good two, three, four year exercise. Okay, so while a not performing asset is an undesirable thing, it is something that banks know will certainly happen. I mean, even if you were to lend some money to 10 of your closest friends, it's very unlikely that everyone will pay up. And if you have friends like mine, then it's likely that none of them will pay up. So what a good bank does is it keeps some money aside from its profits in the anticipation of certain loans going bad. This money is called a provision and the net NPA is simply the gross NPA minus these provisions. As a matter of fact, some reports carry a term called provisioning coverage ratio or PCR, which is nothing but the provisions divided by the gross NPs. And if this number is high, it means the bank is having a larger buffer for themselves against losses in case the NPs start rising. In terms of numbers, and again in the case of HDFC, the net NPA is generally below the 0.5% mark, which shows the bank's proactiveness in not just keeping their NPAs low, but in also providing for potential losses in its loan book. On an average, Indian banks, that is public and private ones, currently operate at a net NPA of 2%, which is a lot lower than the 8% number these banks carried in FY 2018. Point blank, the lower your gross NPA number, the better will be the bank's profitability and the lower the net NPA number, the healthier will be the bank's balance sheet. If you're getting good value from this video, then please do give this video a thumbs up. And if you aren't a subscriber yet, then do consider becoming one as I can then serve you videos as soon as they are released and also share with you some investing strategies, tips and stories that I continually post in the community section. Okay, so we've looked at the raw materials and the risk management part of a banking structure. And now it's important to understand the product portfolio and consequently where the bank is making its money from. So there are four key revenue segments in any bank. There is revenue from treasury operations, there is retail banking, corporate banking, and of course there is revenue from the distribution of third party products. Now you can read up a lot about these four segments and a bank's annual report is the perfect source for it. But as a general principle, if the core of a bank's revenue is coming from retail and corporate, then it's generally a good sign. To take it up a step further, if the retail part is higher than corporate, then it's even better. And I think we've already established the retail versus corporate part earlier in the video. 
In fact, banks make a lot of revenue in the form of fees and therefore fee income is something that investors should definitely keep a track on on a bank on bank basis. For instance, banks like ICICI, HDFC and even Access Bank charge a lot of fees on just about everything which includes foreign exchange, loan processing, trading, ATM withdrawals, etc. In numbers, the proportion of fees in case of private banks is 24% while it's a much more sedate 16% in the case of PSUs. And one can understand why, after all, public sector banks cannot charge a lot of fees because of their social mandate. Now, what also helps is the diversity in fee-based income. For example, ICIC and HDFC are into everything, which makes it easier for them to charge fees at many touch points. In fact, if we connect it back to what I said earlier, because these two banks have a lot of private sector salaried accounts, they already have a ready pool of customers who will need many fee-based services, and this will keep on feeding the revenue engine of these two banks for many more years. And yes, while other banks also provide many services, I don't think they are as diverse as what these two banks have, except maybe the State Bank of India. So as investors, it's always a very worthy exercise to understand how this revenue pie is increasing and in which direction it is increasing, which will give you a clear assessment of the bank's focus, its strategies, and most importantly, where the growth is coming from. The next metric an investor needs to examine is the cost to income ratio, which is simply the operating expenses divided by the operating income. In other words, it's the cost of running a bank and it includes employee salaries, branch costs, cost of technology, printing of an ATM card, etc. So the cost income ratio is a basic one that is used to assess the profitability of a bank. And of course, the lower this ratio is, the better it is. Now, the general trend for the banking industry has been a cost to income ratio of around 50%, with the PSUs being over the 50 mark, while the private banks have been below it. But some of the best run private banks are a lot lower, with HDFC Bank showing the way. In fact, as a thumb rule, if a bank is between 35 and 45%, then it means they are being efficiently run. And as is always the case with any efficiency indicator, it should be looked at as a trend rather than a one-off number as we see how HDFC Bank has brought it down over the past few years. What this declining cost income ratio also shows is that these banks can bring in incremental revenue at a low cost and the more that happens, the better it is for the profitability of that bank. The next three metrics relate to the valuation of a bank in comparison to its peers and the first of these is the return on asset metric. So the ROA shows how efficiently a bank is utilizing its assets in terms of generating revenue from it, which means if a bank is leaving its assets idle for a long period of time, that is, it is taking in deposits but it's not able to lend money, then it not only brings down the ROA and therefore the profits, but it can also lead to a severe asset liability mismatch, which can have severe consequences. Now, the ROA is not a number one should look at in isolation. In fact, the points we discussed earlier, that is the net interest margin, the sources of fund, that is the deposits, the asset quality, that is the gross NPA or the lack of it, are all important determinants in understanding the ROA or might I say the potential future ROA of a bank. So if the NIM is increasing every quarter, if NPAs are going down, then this has a powerful positive impact on the ROA, which then allows for a re-rating for that banking stock and an investor can make a lot of money out of it. Additionally, and as is the case with most metrics, it's preferable to see the ROA as a trend. That is, look at this number over a few years to get a better idea on where it is headed. For instance, banks like Kotak Mahindra and HDFC have maintained their ROA a lot better and very consistently as compared to an ICICI and Access Bank. In fact, ICICI Bank is a good case study here which has seen erratic ROA numbers and that's because this bank has lost its focus not once but twice in the last 16-17 years. So as a thumb rule, the best banks have an ROA of over 1.5% which is one place most public sector banks don't fit in with many of them falling below the 1% mark. Come to think of it, even 1% is actually not bad because the last decade has been very poor for PSU banks. But this doesn't mean investing in a PSU is bad. I would say it is more to do with timing. So if you keep a track of the numbers and act when you see an uplift, then the odds of making money even from PSU banks can see a massive improvement. Okay, the next commonly used valuation metric is the price to book value ratio. 
Now, this metric can't be a surprise to any of us. After all, the banking business is all about managing their investment and loan book efficiently. And somewhere both these metrics, that is the price to book value and the ROA are interconnected. For example, a bank like Kotak trades at a price to book of over four, almost five, because it also has an ROA of over two. The same goes for HDFC Bank and also ICICI Bank to some extent, but not as much for other private banks and definitely not for public sector banks. Now, just like the ROA or any valuation metric, investors should examine the price to book ratio as a trend across years and across banks to get a better idea of where it is heading. So essentially, if one sees the inherent characteristics of a bank improving, but if the price to book ratio is still lagging, then that presents us with a valuation gap that can be looked at. And our final examination area when looking at banks is the value of its subsidiaries. Now, most banks create subsidiaries and they generally have an asset management company that is a mutual fund company, a life insurance company, a general insurance company, a broking business, a financing company for only vehicle loans or lending to subprime customers, etc. These are generally joint ventures with domestic or international companies and although they might have started small in 10-20 years of operations, these subsidiaries would have become a lot valuable in the overall scheme of things. For example, the State Bank of India has a number of subsidiaries, some listed and some unlisted. Among the listed ones, it has its credit card business and also it has a life insurance business, while the general insurance and asset management arm is yet to be listed. Now, I read in a recent report that the value of SBI stake in these four subsidiaries is a little over 200 rupees a share, which is a lot and is almost 40% of the bank's share price. So when you're valuing a bank, valuing these subsidiaries is very important. And because it's a tiresome exercise, what I generally do is to take a consensus from some of the many research reports that are available on the internet. All right, so we've covered 11 points in this video. And if you do this right, then in my opinion, you can evaluate any bank in the country using the framework that we just discussed. So to quickly summarize it, we want to have a clear idea about the bank's deposit book and its growth, the loan book and how it has grown, how the NIM, the net interest margin has been moving, the cost of funds and deposits, which ideally should be low, the CASA ratio and the CASA amount over the years, the loan book composition in terms of retail and corporate, the capital adequacy ratio, which should be high, the gross and net NPAs, which should be low, as should be the cost to income ratio. Further, we should track the growth in interest and fee income, the growth in customer acquisition, before we top it off with an understanding of the ROA, the price to book value ratio, and the value of subsidiaries. On an individual bank basis, I have tried to put everything in a single table and have taken the most recent numbers that were available to me. I request you to continually track and update these numbers. And if I'm not mistaken, some stock screeners have smartly tweaked their template so that a different set of variables can be shown for banking stocks as compared to manufacturing companies. Point blank, you have to have a better understanding of banks. After all, it's the most important sector in modern commerce and no wonder it constitutes a fairly high percentage of India's GDP and stock market capitalization. It's a business that's only going to grow, but it'll grow in cycles. And if you can enter or exit the sector or individual banks at the right moments, then there is a lot of money to be made. I sincerely hope this video will be a starting point in your own research. And if you like this video, then do give it a thumbs up and I'll see you three days from now. Until then.